my name is Aisha Richardson. I'm a member of the Black Caucus and Michael Laws is the Black Caucus um, chair and he's our tech person today. And so we we're interviewing the candidate seeking office. And so tell us a little bit about yourself and why are you seeking the office of Auditor General? Oh, thank you. I really appreciate you both. Um, so I'm born and raised here in the heart of North Philadelphia. Um, I'm a state representative in 181st district. And, you know, really I'm running for Auditor General because I think the government should actually work and it should work for working people and working families. And I know that, you know, people running for office say that, but I will tell you the Auditor General role is one of the most powerful in terms of actually achieving that outcome. You know, this is the one job in government that is supposed to be and can be and should be laser focused on finding problems in government, finding ways in which systems aren't actually delivering for people, and then pulling folks together to fix it. You know, I talk all the time about, you know, my background growing up in North Philly, which you know well, Aisha, of folks who are working their butts off every single day um, and are still, you know, juggling it all to try to figure it out. And so when we talk about a government program working or delivering, this is not like some hypothetical academic exercise that I'm engaged in. This is a real brass tacks understanding of what that means for people, what it means for a family to need LAHIP. I know what that means to fill out that application and need it to be processed quickly. What it means to depend on CHIP or Medicaid or Medicare, um, you know, what it means to need that rent rebate program, which is why I was so proud, you know, as a member of the finance committee that we, you know, fought hard and got through the process, um, a bill to expand the rent mortgage rebate program, really lowering the, the burden on so many seniors, folks with disabilities. But right now we need to do so much more. And I think people watching right now can think of five other programs that they know aren't showing up in their lives in the way that they need to. And we have to bridge that gap because as much as I think folks who showed up on January 6th and were trying to destroy the government because they didn't get that way, as much as I see that as a threat to our democracy, I also see as a great threat to our democracy, people have thrown their hands up and say, nobody's in this for me. None of this is working for me. And I'm self-selecting to not engage in the process. That also is a big threat. And as Auditor General, I want people to know not only do I feel that frustration in my bones in a real way, but that I'm gonna use this office um, and use all the tools and the resources of this office um, to um, help fix these problems that I intimately understand. Yeah, so one of the things that you mentioned was about medical assistance. And mm -hmm. what we're finding with the uh, MCOs is that a lot of folks who are providers are being locked out of the system, whether they are mental health providers or whether they're home health mm -hmm. providers, they just are not able to be able to be under contract. And sometimes it's because the provider network is quote unquote robust, but a lot of times a robust provider network doesn't necessarily mean that folks are accepting clients. So you get right. folks in the in this waiting period or having to travel long distances. And so it would be great if we can get that audit to show how far people are traveling because state law says you shouldn't travel more than if you're in an urban area, an hour for an appointment. And if you're in a rural area, two hours for an appointment. And so is that really what's going on? And then the other thing is folks who are um, on medical assistance and have the home health care aids and their hours have been reduced. And so during the pandemic, a lot of people's hours are being reduced and they had no place to go. So what was going on was that we were getting a lot of complaints about it, but it wasn't reflecting at the Department of Insurance because people couldn't get through because there was nobody there to answer their calls. So those are the types of things that I think would be great for an Auditor General to look into because we need to follow state law in terms of having a robust provider network and making sure that folks are able to get access to quality health care. Yeah, you know, and th thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. And, I, you know, I know that you and I are offline, you know, have talked about this, this, this problem before. And, you know, something I always or like, like to say is that, you know, data is the language of systems. And if we're going to fix these systems, we have to bring in data that not only uncovers the depths of these problems, but to put forward 
um, you know, serious, substantive, actionable recommendations, you know, for legislators to really look at and fix. And also having that understanding and that relationship with other legislators, understanding how, you know, the sausage gets made, so to speak, you know, puts me in a position to not just produce another report that you or I will never read or that no legislator will read, but to lay out recommendations in a way that are digestible for the public so they feel armed with the information to say like, hey, the Auditor General showed like not only has it taken me more than two hours, but this is how many other people are similarly situated. Um, and to be able to provide that information in a way that people can go to their elected officials and feel empowered to make the case for themselves. But additionally, to speak, you know, to my 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 colleagues about what needs to be done from a legislative perspective, or working with the administration to say this is what can be done administratively. Um, you know, one of the ways that I'm going to judge my own time and help other people judge me is not by how many reports I can produce, but by how many of those reports lead to robust change. Um, and I think that having an understanding of how the legislative process works is is critical, but also for the people who've called, um, you know, the office where you work or called or called my office with those concerned as well. Sometimes people can only speak to their personal circumstance. And that's valuable data, that, that anecdotal data. And as my partner would say, anecdotal data is data. But people, but putting people in a position where they feel like, hey, I'm not alone with this. I'm not imagining this. This is not because I'm not smart enough or I'm not filling out the paperwork right, but there is a structural problem here that we need to shift. Um, not only, you know, can that make individuals, I think, feel better as they, you know, get pushed through the torrent of bureaucracy on occasion, but also I think it helps become a real organizing tool for people to say, hey, if there are other people going through this, now how do we get together? and be able to organize with this data as a driver and as a tool set um, to push our elected officials using the language of systems that they so often use. Yeah, I, totally, all of that, all of it. Uh, so our next question is um, your road to victory. We know mm -hmm. that you were uh, endorsed by the Pennsylvania Democratic Party. Yeah, Congratulations. Very exciting. You were endorsed by the Black Caucus and several of the other caucuses um, during our winter state committee meeting. And so tell us a little bit about what your road to victory looks like. Yes, thank you. You know, first of all, to all the state committee members in particular who watch this, thank you so much, um, you know, for your support it means a heck of a lot to me. And I think it speaks to the fact that our party is putting forward a ticket and candidates that reflect the regional uh, racial lived experience of our of our communities. And I think that that speaks to what Democrats are gonna do to be successful. Um, let me start in a bit of an odd way for a candidate. I think the way that we win is if we win together. Um, I always believe democracy is a team sport, campaigns are a team sport. And so as I think about what it's gonna take to win in the general election, it's going to be about, you know, certainly my team, but I think the other candidates who are on the ballot, not seeing this as a zero sum game just for their election, but looking at how as a ticket, we can be thoughtful about leaning into our strengths um, geographically um, in terms of our, our, our backgrounds, constituency groups, um, and communicating how everybody up and down that ticket is going to have a role. You know, it's critical that we reelect Joe Biden, but we know it would be a bad day in Pennsylvania if we only reelect the president and lose the attorney general's race and lose the auditor general's race and lose the treasurer's seat. Don't keep uh, control of the House of Representatives. Don't close the margin in the Senate. And so I don't think that's something you can do when the primary is over. You have to have that vision from the beginning. And so our approach is to go everywhere, talk to everybody we we can, um, and to make sure that we're we're bringing. Uh, the you know stellar message and credentials um, of the other candidates um, as we as we go across the Commonwealth. You know we're also going to be doing everything we can um, to engage our volunteer base. And our first you know big big uh, test of that um, is going to be with petitions, which start here in a couple of a couple of weeks to be able to show that you know we have an organization um, that can mobilize to do some of the you know blocking and tackling of politics. Um, that's that's going to be necessary. And that, again, 
we're able to mobilize those those volunteers for people who are running for state senate, running for state hours, running up and down, you know, the, the the ballot because that's the approach that I saw with our judicial candidates. And I think that's why all four of them won. You know, we couldn't just have one of them and we needed all of them and they're all gonna make our judiciary so much better. Um and that was the approach that that I saw um, you know, them take and that's the approach we certainly are gonna take as well. So you just answered my last question um, <laughs> <laughs> about running together and how successful the judicial candidates were. But, you know, I actually I'm going to bring up something that mm -hmm. um, folks have, uh, folks have um, have really um, struggled with. And that is um, the polls that are indicating um, the voter um, lack of engagement or or lack of enthusiasm about mm -hmm. the Biden Harris ticket. And so how do you feel the down ballot candidates will be able to help Joe Biden rise to the top in November? Yeah, there's this um you know, thank you for that. There's this idea there has been, you know, political science about presidential coattails. And certainly I think um, you know, there will be some of that. With, there are certainly some voters who are going to show up to vote for the president and then just vote for us as a consequence. Um, but I think there's, you know, burgeoning uh, research as well about reverse coattails and about what's necessary to lift from the bottom up. And that's why the point that I made about us having a ticket that looks like the Commonwealth, that reflects our regional diversity, that reflects our, um, you know, our live life diversity, all of that's going to be going to be critical. You know, I'm I'm confident. You know, I just got back actually from South Carolina. I'm on the president's uh, national advisory board, uh, the only state rep in the country actually, and so I was just in South Carolina with some of my colleagues down there, um, and with voters um, talking about um, you know what's at stake in this election, about what they're hearing, about what they're feeling, and a part of what's clear to me is Joe Biden in some way has. He suffers from what Trump benefits from. And hear me out on this. I think when we think about the ridiculousness of Donald Trump, it's so difficult sometimes to get people to focus in on individual comments that he makes that are bad because every single day there's something new and crazy that is set. And so people kind of just, you know, wash it all up to, I'm sure he said something. What specifically he said, maybe I don't know and I don't follow, even when what he said is really bad and what could have a real negative impact, you know, on Black Americans. Talking about using um, the military um, in our streets, in communities of color, name checking Philadelphia as one of the places they want to send the American military. I mean, that's not something that, you know, our constitutional, constitutional republic, I think, can endure. You know, on occasion, we brought in the National Guard, but, you know, those under the auspice of the governor, not under the president. And so to have military in our streets um, would not only be terrifying, but they are not in any way prepared to do the type of urban policing that we need in our community to make us safe. Um, when he talks about um, a Muslim ban 2.0, when you have, you know, one third of the city of Philadelphia identify as, as Muslim and certainly, you know, pockets all across our, our commonwealth, that's a real direct impact on our families. When he talks about rounding up Muslims, I think about, I mean, excuse me, rounding up um, new Americans or aspiring Americans, immigrants to our nation. Um, I think about people who I love and care about um, in the Lehigh Valley and um, in Nipa and all across our Commonwealth where they're making Pennsylvania their home. And he wants to take our friends and neighbors, round them up and put them in camps. And so getting people to hear all those different things is sometimes a challenge. Now, for President Biden, sometimes actually explaining all the good things that he has done is a challenge as well, because what the president has done has been able to shepherd a number of really big pieces of legislation. I mean, meaningful pieces of legislation. But, you know, Aisha, you do this for a living. Look at legislation and look at all these different things. But the average person doesn't do that for a living. And so being able to understand everything that was in the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, the largest investment um, in uh, climate resilience in world history of any government ever anywhere in the world. Um, the fact that through the bipartisan infrastructure plan, we have now dedicated enough resources to take out every lead pipe in America, not just in Flint, 
in every community in America. The resources have been appropriated to do that. Um, when we look at what the president has done around gun violence, even with a Congress that has refused to meaningfully um, act, um, and the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which you know closed some of those, those loopholes, it's difficult to have the average person be able to quote to you all of those different things. And so I think a part of what we're going to have to do is to make that case to people, to, to go to communities and talk about the individual things that matter most to people, and to say what we have to say every election. I mean, you know, no person goes in the office, even with highest hopes, incredible talent, and is able to get all the things done that they want to get done in one year, in one term, it literally never happens. You know, we need to do more on student loan debt, but I think it's a big deal that the president canceled $137 billion of student loans. Um, and, you know, I think it'd be great if we didn't have a Supreme Court um, that was overturning his further actions um, on student loan reduction. Um, so, so I think that we have between now in November, a real opportunity and responsibility in these videos that you're doing are gonna be a big part of that, of engaging with people on the substance of what the president has done, but also on the stakes of what a Donald Trump presidency would mean to our lives and to our families. And I, for one, am committed to making sure that doesn't happen. And I think when we do that, um, I think it resounds to the benefit of everybody up and down the ticket. Yeah, you know, one of the things that um, that we we've been talking about in these um, in these interviews is that there may be a lack of enthusiasm for um, Biden, but people are certainly enthusiastic about voting rights. They're enthusiastic about their um, reproductive rights, and they certainly are enthusiastic about maintaining our Constitution and don't want folks who are willing to overthrow our government in charge of our government. So um, I think that some when we have those kinds of conversations, then I think that we are... Um, that we're able to to move forward. Um, I think one of the questions that we also wanted to ask is uh, um, the relationship between the African American community and the Biden administration. And so, you know, just can you talk? I know that you're here to talk about yourself, but oh, you know, can you can you yeah, can you talk a little bit about um, the Biden Biden administration and the Black community? Yeah, you know what? Now, 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 make this connection because I think it's critical. You know, when I talked about the um, the resources to change out every lead pipe in America. We know that disproportionately access to all types of resources, but particularly, you know, water is something so, so basic and so critical. Um, those lead pipes, a lot of them are in black neighborhoods, are in um, low income uh, communities as, as well, people of all backgrounds. And so like, that's, that's critical. But when we talk about those federal dollars coming into Pennsylvania, the auditor general has the ability um, to audit those federal dollars to make sure we're using them, um, you know, ways in line with, uh, you know, state and federal law. And so we're going to be looking to make sure those investments are reaching people in a way that they can see, touch and feel. But I would, you know, highlight a couple of a, a number of other um, examples, you know, what the president has done to negotiate, uh, to put us in a position to negotiate uh, drug prices through Medicaid for the first time in American history. Literally, presidents have been talking about this since Medicaid began. It was this president that got it done, the cap uh, on the cost of insulin for 35 bucks a month. I mean, I can think about my mom and my aunts and so many others who depend on insulin because um, they have diabetes. And we know the impact of um, diabetes and high blood pressure um, in the Black communities in particular. And so making those uh, medications readily available, um, that's a big deal for Black folks. Um, when I talk about the, the steps to deal with gun violence reduction through the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act and through executive orders that the president has made, that's about lowering uh, lowering crime and increasing people's uh, safety and feelings of safety within their their own community. What is the impact then? You know, in my legislative district, you know, um, shootings are down twenty three percent. Now, listen, is that the the hundred percent that we need? No, 
But I'll tell you, I'll, I'll say it as the uh, Captain Goodson, the 22nd District says it, you know, that's 48 more families who don't have to bury a loved one or have to say goodbye to a loved one who's going to be incarcerated because they made a really bad decision. And so those reductions um, mean something to real people in their in their real lives. And so when I look at the broad swath of things that have been accomplished, I think there's been a very intentional eye on what we're going to do for and with the Black community. I think it's one of the reasons you've seen the largest um, creation of new Black-owned businesses in American history. Um, and for women, the largest creation of businesses by women um, owners in American history across uh, you know, the racial gap. Um, and then if you look at unemployment, this is the lowest level of unemployment for Black Americans um, in American history. And inflation is at its lowest it's been since before President Biden came in office. And so I think on all the things that matter, things are moving in the right direction. We have a lot more that we need to get done. But we can't get that done if we continue to have a Republican Congress, which is why what you said, Aisha, about the, um, you know, folks in whom your congressman is, 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 is critical. And I think about a seat that the Black Hawk is going to play a big role in, Scott Perry's seat um, in Harrisburg and York, um, in Dauphin County in York. Um, that's a seat where a lot of Black folks live, um, including my aunt and uncles and a lot of my cousins who've been represented by an actual um, of, you know, insurrectionists um, who could have some different representation in Congress. Um, and that one seat could be critical to us flipping that U.S. House of Representatives and having folks who are going to be committed um, to helping the president and not just manufacturing crises every other day to try to stop um, the type of progress that we need to see. So, so you know, I'm, I'm excited to do, you know, my new job with your help as Auditor General to make sure that all the resources that are coming in are getting where they're supposed to get to. But I'm but I'm also excited that we have a president who I don't think just talks about Black people or just asks Black people for their vote, but I think has a real record that we have to look at and examine and connect people with. And, you know, I'm excited to do that work. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, if you want to get in touch it. with you, do you want to set, do a shout out for your campaign website or you know anything like that as you close? Yeah, please, of course. So um, my website is Malcolm Kenyatta. Uh, dot com. That's M A L C O L M. So two L's, two M's. Then Kenyatta, K E N Y A T T A. Um, dot com. And also it's Malcolm at Malcolm Kenyatta on any of the socials, wherever you are, we're there at Malcolm Kenyatta. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful to the Black Caucus. I look forward to seeing so many of you who watch this in your uh, community. And um, and I know that we have to we have to reach people. And so thank you, Aisha and Mike, for, you know, hosting these conversations. Sure. And, you know, this isn't the end. We'll we'll continue to have these conversations and update folks on what's going on. And thank you so much for taking the time. Now go get some rest. Okay. Thank you, Malcolm. <laughs> thank you, Malcolm. I appreciate you. Take care. Bye.